All right, hi there, I'm Tim Sullivan. I'm the executive director of UC Press and I'm here with Renee Albling, the author of the new book, Gynecology, The Missing Science of Men's Reproductive Health. Welcome, Renee. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Renee is an associate professor of sociology at, the Yale, at Yale University and her research focuses on gender and medicine. She's also written the award-winning book, Sex Cells, C-E-L-L-S, The Medical Market for Eggs and Sperm. But today we're gonna to talk about gynecology. That is spelled G-U-Y-N-E-C-O-L-O-G-Y, gynecology, which argues that the historical lack of biomedical attention to men's reproductive health has profound implications for contemporary reproductive politics. In fact, only recently have researchers begun to ask basic questions about how men's health matters for reproductive outcomes from miscarriage to childhood illness. Gynecology examines these gaps in knowledge through fascinating historical documents, interviews, media coverage, and more. So Renee, I was saying before we started recording, I find this totally fascinating, but can you start off by just telling us what inspired you to write the book and to get into this line of research? Sure. Uh, well, you know, my first book, as you just mentioned, was uh, Sex Cells, and that was a book about the market for egg donors and sperm donors in the US. So I like to joke with this book that I went all in on the sperm. So it really is <laughs> one of the few people, uh, you know, to be able to say that they are an expert on, on the history of how we think about men's bodies, how we think about sperm health. Um, so it was, it was really sort of in, after finishing that first book, thinking about what next. And I became very interested in the history of the medical profession and how it began to really carve the body uh, up into different specialties starting at the end of the 19th century. And my original plan, which I had some very dear friends dissuade me from doing, was to do sort of a, a history of all of that carving, you know, all the different ways that different bits of the body became the province of different specialties. You know, one of my favorite being that, you know, cardiologists have the heart, but there's a different specialty for the veins. Uh, right. But obviously, those are quite connected. Um, so one of my friends, Sarah, Richard, Sarah Richardson, actually a historian at Harvard, um, and I were in a working group uh, with Joanna Radin, another historian here at Yale, and I was trying to sort of think about where to start. And they said, well, why don't you start with what you know? You know about the reproductive body. And mm -hmm. so there we go. So I started in on thinking about the history of GYN, gynecology, and then began wondering, well, why isn't there, you know, a male version of mm -hmm. uh, gynecology? Why isn't there a reproductive health specialty for men? And in fact, that became an entire book <laughs> without right. having to do the whole rest of the body. <laughs> right. So I'm going to just start there. Why isn't there a specialization for men's reproductive health? Yes. Well, you know, it's one of these things that sociologists specialize in, which is, you know, once we point it out, then it becomes an obvious question, right? But mm -hmm. this is... It's not something that physicians have noticed. It's not something that scientists have noticed. And it really, the answer to that question goes back to the 19th century. So, you know, the medical profession, as it became a profession in the middle of the 19th century, um, didn't start off as having specialties. They were mm -hmm. just really becoming, you know, a profession and, pos you know, position themselves opposed to midwives, homeopaths, other sort of healers that they viewed as not professional. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't take long for them to start breaking out into specialties. And so obstetrics and mm -hmm. GYN gynecology were some of the earliest specialties. They quickly became institutionalized. They had journals and specialized hospitals mm -hmm. and specialized meetings. Um, and there was an attempt actually at that time around 1889, 1890, um, there was a group of physicians who came together and said, hey, you know, we need a male analog to gynecology. Mm -hmm. Um, and they called it andrology, so taking the Greek root for men instead of women. Um, and they tried to form a specialty for you know, men's reproductive bodies. And essentially, they were laughed out of the pages mm. of medical journals. Um, and so I'm, this is the first real history of that particular moment. It's what I spend the first chapter of the book talking about. And I argue that we're still living with the consequences today. Um, if there had been a full-blown specialty for men's reproductive health, in the 1890s, we would have gotten journals and clinicians and scientists and hospitals and sort of a community of people who would have come together to create knowledge and to build on that knowledge. And that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you know, what I argue in the book is that it's a making of non-knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. There is a lack of knowledge about men's reproductive health that can be traced back to this lack of institutionalized medical attention. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to come back to the consequences, the kind of the, the non-knowledge part of that, because it's kind of fascinating both intellectually about the gap, but also there are real practical consequences to that. Um, but two questions that follow on. So why, why in kind of the first two areas of focus, what's the, what's the, I could guess you're the expert, the impetus behind that. And then, um, and a following on from that is uh, why were they left out of the room? What was the what was the focal point of the derision for the andrologists? Sure. Well, OBGYNs were among the first. So interestingly, mm -hmm. the very first was actually eyes ophthalmology, mm -hmm. um, and that's you know it makes sense. You don't really want people mucking around in your eyes when they don't <laughs> really really know what they're doing. Right. Um, so eyes, ears, uh, and then eventually OBGYN hearts. Um, mm -hmm. Later came pediatricians, so they specialize in a particular developmental phase, not a particular part of the body. Um, but OB and GYN were among the first. And so very early on, you know, the thought experiment here would be, well, you know, at the time, physicians knew that reproduction involved male and female bodies. Um, mm -hmm. It would have been possible to have a specialty for reproduction that mm -hmm. would have treated both men and women, but that's not what happened. You have sort of women's reproductive bodies being hived off from the rest of medical knowledge and being treated as, as its own area of specialization. Um, and the sort of attempt to create a parallel specialty, um, you know, is really rooted in a binary understanding of gender. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that there are only two sexes, that they are opposites uh, to each other, um, is the reason why you get people arguing that there could be a male analog to mm -hmm. OBGYN. Um, and so now, you know, that's fast forwarding to the current moment, we can talk about how the, you know, activists and scholars working on transgender and non-binary people are really unsettling our understandings of gender, which is going to definitely have an impact on how we think about reproduction. But to go back to the 19th century, um, that attempt to start andrology was considered suspect because mostly what they were treating at the time uh, men's reproductive health was largely about venereal disease, mm -hmm. uh, which was rampant at the end of the 19th century. There was no real cure. Um, and so these physicians were basically trying to take on an area of medicine that was stigmatized uh, because of its association with illicit sexuality. Um, mm -hmm. And so they basically got uh, stigmatized by association. Um, and so medical journals would say, you know, well, we don't, we certainly don't need a medical specialty just for men's reproductive bodies. And we certainly don't want to elevate venereal disease to the same level as pregnancy and birth. Um, so it really is, you know, there's sort of a gender dynamic and a uh, history of medicine dynamic that's going on that comes together to make it impossible to think about a specialty for men's reproductive health at the end of the 19th century. And so that's fascinating. And so once there's that kind of body of non-knowledge, right, creation of this empty space, so that just persists. And how long, what, how long does it persist? Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about the consequences of its persistence. Sure, yeah. Well, I think, you know, so if I were sort of to spin out a brief history of women's reproductive health, right? So at the end of the 19th century, you get OB and GYN as medical mm -hmm. specialties. In the 1920s, Nellie Uchorn has documented the discovery of estrogen and testosterone, sort of the hormonal understanding of the body comes into play. And estrogen was discovered before testosterone because women's bodies were more available because they were going to GYN clinics. Um, so at, at that point, there's another sort of missed opportunity for men's bodies to be studied and understood. Mm -hmm. Again, another few decades pass, you get the contraceptive pill for women we still have no contraceptive pill for men, mm -hmm. right? So there's sort of a way to see women's bodies and reproductive health and the way that they're linked, looping all the way through the 20th century to the present mm -hmm. day. Um, and it's that non-looping, right? So it's actually very difficult to prove an absence, but right. I went through and looked at the scientific literature. I looked at media reports. Um, I interviewed people to sort of demonstrate the lack of attention to male reproductive bodies that loops all the way through the 20th century up until the present day. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way that this starts to get interrupted a little bit is um, there was actually a, a second attempt to launch andrology as a medical specialty mm -hmm. at the end of the 1960s. Um, and these folks did not know that they weren't the first and they mm -hmm. did not know that they were not the first to use the term andrology, um, but they had a similar goal. They wanted to create a specialty 
around men's reproductive health, and they were a little bit successful. So andrology is now, it exists. Um, there's about 600 andrologists in the US. Uh, they work mostly in sperm banks, which is why I had heard of them before. And so they do have journals and professional meetings, and now there's a little bit of attention to things like sperm health. Their reemergence was concomitant with the 1970s movements around uh, feminism and patients' rights and men's rights. Mm -hmm. So in the book, you know, I, I sort of draw out the argument that with all of those social movements, we get a different way of thinking about the body such that men's reproductive health at least becomes thinkable as an area of specialization, not so stigmatized. Um, and then of course, as the environmental movement picks up and we start to understand the effects of chemicals on the body, then you have a lot more questions being asked by scientists about the effects on men's health, on their fertility, on their sperm. Um, so starting in the 70s, you do sort of start to see a sprinkling of scientific research about men's reproductive health. Um, and then it really picks up in the last decade or two. And that's, I wanted to, the next question that I wanted to ask was about the consequences of that gap and not specifically, so there are clearly consequences on an individual level about your own, one's own reproductive health, but kind of broader social consequences as well that you could speak to. Sure, yeah. And I would say, you know, just to summarize sort of in a, a bullet point, like what the, what the news is here is that it's, in, it's been the last decade or two that scientists and clinicians have really realized that a man's health prior to conception, especially in the three months that it takes sperm to grow in the male body, um, that a man's age, his physical health, his exposures to toxins um, in his food or in the air he's breathing, the water he's drinking, that all of these things can damage sperm. Uh, not damage it so much that it can't fertilize an egg, but damage the, the DNA inside the sperm in such a way that it can actually affect his children's health, right? So it can increase the rate of miscarriage. It can lead to childhood illnesses. One example here is that uh, it's been 10 years since epidemiologists started saying that paternal smoking actually raises the risk of cancer in their children. Mm -hmm. um, and that men should be, you know, if men were planning to have children, that they should be warned to stop smoking, right? But one of the consequences of there being so little infrastructure for men's reproductive health is that this new information, this new knowledge, now that it's finally being made, is not making its way to the general public. So most people have never heard that. Um, and as a result, you know, there's both sort of individual level consequences, as you mentioned, but also mm -hmm. social level consequences. Mm -hmm. Um, and on a societal level, I would say that one of the major consequences is when it comes to reproductive politics, we still think of legislation around pregnancy health, around contraception, around abortion. We think of this as a women's issue, that it's women's responsibility, it's women's business, it's solely on women. Um, and in fact, we're missing some amount of reproductive risk because we're not looking at men's health. We're not measuring it. We're not warning men. We're not giving them the chance to actually improve their health. Um, so there's that sort of like individual bodily health level. Mm -hmm. At a more societal level, I would just take a step back and reference, you know, the current moment we're in. At the same time, as we do start to talk about men's reproductive health, I really think it's important that we don't make the same mistakes that we've made around women's reproductive health. Mm -hmm. And I would say the main mistake there is these public health messages that target individual women, telling them to, you know, beware of what they're eating, beware of what they're drinking, beware of what they're breathing. Um, there's only so much control that individuals have over their own health, right? Mm -hmm. The coronavirus has made it just deadly clear to all of us that some amount of our health is the result of structural processes and social institutions that are either there or not there. Um, health is a matter of financial resources. Health mm -hmm. is a matter of the level of racism. Health is a matter of the level of economic inequality in a society. So I think as we you know, take the newness of men's reproductive health in, it's an opportunity to rethink public health messages so that it's not just about individual bodies and individual behaviors, that we could as a society come together and make everybody healthier, uh, whether or not they're reproducing you know, or not. Um, so that's really, you know, I do wanna sort of get to that, the sort of importance of mm -hmm. these social outcomes, but also think very carefully about how we approach those. Right, and put in the larger public, really public health context of, right. of the relatedness that we all have to one another with uh, respect to our outcomes. Exactly. For sure. And so we can take it, I'm just curious about kind of one level down from that, because one thing you said was about infrastructure. There's an infrastructure around, as flawed as it may be, 
um, and as uh, flawed as the messaging may be, there is an infrastructure that exists around women's reproductive health in particular and health in general. So I'm just curious, taking one step down from the public health level, what does an infrastructure look like? Or is that even the right question to ask? What would an infrastructure look like for men's reproductive health um, before we get to the kind of public interconnectedness of all of our health outcomes? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's actually the question that I wrestled with the most in writing the conclusion to the book. Um, because on the one hand, you could imagine, well, you can make an argument that we have women's reproductive health over here, we need men's reproductive health over here. Right. Um, and in fact, I think that what that would end up doing is reify the gender binary, right? Kind of underscore the idea that we are all just one of two separate sexes. Um, so in fact, I ended up coming around to an argument that was really about taking this moniker of reproductive health and expanding it to include men. Um, that umbrella of reproductive health is already being expanded to include um, transgender people and people who are gender non-binary. So now mm -hmm. OBGYNs have started talking about pregnant people instead of mm -hmm. pregnant women, right? Mm -hmm. So as we expand that umbrella um, to think about reproductive health, I think you can sort of include men in there. So the infrastructure would look like this. Right? If you would have um, any sort of clinician who was being trained, whether it was a physician in an OBGYN residency program or somebody in pediatrics or a nursing student who was going to study reproductive health, that you would have content available about paternal effects, about how men's health matters for their children's health. Um, you would, so one of the things that I did for the book was I went to look at all the government agencies, so the CDC, the NIH, and I went to see, do they have any information on their websites about men's mm. reproductive health? And the answer is there's almost nothing there, right? Yeah. So the infrastructure there would be to add some information, <laughs> some basic information for the public. Um, interestingly, I think one of the things I was most surprised about doing the research is I interviewed 40 men about how they think about reproduction, how they understand their role in reproductive health. And most of them said that they hadn't thought about their own role in reproduction at all since high school. Because the last time that they hear anything about their own reproductive systems is in a health education class or a sex ed class. So I think there's actually an important role for high school teachers here to incorporate some of that into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a couple of you know, really easy ways that you sort of add it to the pre-existing infrastructure around reproductive health, mm -hmm. which is mostly focused on women, but expand that focus and use that to get this message out that you know, men's health matters. Right, so there are these short-term um or short horizon solutions that are relatively easy about information exchange and delivery. And then there is the big systemic issue around public health of which this is one part, which is really exactly. fascinating. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. This is absolutely fascinating. Uh, this was our conversation with Renee Almeling, uh, author of Gynecology, which is now on sale in both print and digital formats wherever books are sold. I encourage you to go to bookshop.org or your local independent bookstore. Renee, thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks.